Hi, my name is Sky Nelson, and I recently gave this talk at the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences conference in San Diego, and it was well received, and uh, I was asked by some of the participants to put it online. So here it is, the, the much abridged version uh, for you to take in on YouTube. Retroactive event determination and its relativistic roots. I'm going to try and show that light doesn't objectively travel, just appears to have traveled when measured and that the state of light and everything else is obser observer-dependent or observation-dependent. Uh, predictions, implications, ontology, and metaphysics will be looked at briefly, and uh, my goal is to not get interrupted. Hopefully you won't be able to do that retroactively through uh, watching the movie, um, and leave time for questions. All right, here we go. The so there exists a conceptual gap between special relativity and quantum theory that has been there since the beginning. Uh, special relativity assumes that light travels at a fixed speed, the speed of light, relative to all inertial observers, which is true. Um, but quantum mechanics shows that we can't make definite statements about a system between measurements. So this, this conceptual gap that relativity assumes that light is moving at the speed c relative to every observer, even if it's not being observed by an observer. But quantum mechanics, the formalism, shows that that just can't be the case uh, for objects in general. So we got a conceptual gap, and I'm going to try and resolve that um, through the following conclusions. A photon state must be observer-dependent, or observation-dependent. Uh, a photon will appear to travel at light-like intervals when measured, according to the simultaneity principle. But between measurements, it will have no definite state. In other words, space-time is not well-defined between measurements. So step one, light is timeless. This is a well-understood uh, conclusion from the extreme case of time dilation. If you look at Lorentz's equations, they show that in the extreme case, uh, at the speed of light, time would become infinitely dilated or uh, actually meaningless, as we'll see. And I, it says here, I'll try a brief proof, but I'm going to skip that for now for the sake of speed, and you can go ahead and read the paper um, if you're interested. So starting with the Minkowski diagram, we're going to look at how simultaneous events would be observed. This is well understood by probably most of the audience watching this, so I'll go quickly. E and F are two different events. If I'm traveling vertically up the uh, y-axis, I'm going to, or up the t-axis in this case, I'm going to send out a light signal that travels to the right and hits event F, and another one that right travels to the right and hits event E. And when I receive those later, I'm going to mark the positions where I receive those. And at the halfway point between the sending and the receiving of each signal, I'll figure that's exactly when the event happened, according to my reference frame. So these two events would appear simultaneous for two different observers not moving relative to each other. Uh, if two observers are moving relative to each other, you've got one of them at a slight angle here, the same geometry is going to give you a slightly different result um, where the object that's further away is going to appear to happen first. That's f prime. And if you're traveling much, much faster, closer to the speed of light, you'll see that the event f prime happens far before e prime, which happens far before you know where e and f appear on the graph for the stationary observer. So what I'm trying to show here graphically is that if you extend this out to consider light itself, what light itself would be registering when it interacts with objects, um, e prime and f prime become completely uh, uh, infinitely stretched out. So the order of events makes uh, no sense. If you talk about ordering events for light, light doesn't perceive ordered events. It, it has no sense of time and no sense of ordered events. They become meaningless. So if you have a concern about, as, as you probably should, that we can't actually apply Lorentz's equation when we reach the speed of light, no object can go the speed of light, I completely agree with you and I encourage you to read the paper to find out uh, why this is still valid. I go into, into great detail. Um, so restating conclusion one, time and space are undefined from the perspective of light. Okay, moving on. Step two, light timelessly connects events. So what I call the asynchronicity principle, but is actually you know, the, the, the same as the original simultaneity principle from relativity. I go into detail as to why I've renamed it in the paper. Um, we find that just as we just said, T prime from the, from the perspective of the light would be equal to zero. It would measure no separation between different events. And we just apply Lorentz's transformation to that. Um, we find that a very simple result, T, the time between the events from the inertial point of view, is equal to L over C, where L is the distance between the events from the inertial point of view, and C is the speed of light. Long story short, what this is saying, if you interpret it the way I interpret it, light appears to have moved at a light-like interval light appears to have traveled a distance l in a time t. 
but this is just from the perspective of the inertial observer and we have to remember that the time i mean that the light doesn't perceive any change in or any separation in time or space so obviously it can't perceive distance or time between events but the inertial observer will observe exactly a light like interval between them and this is why we measure light to travel it at a certain speed all the time uh, but it doesn't mean that it's actually doing that because from its point of view it's not registering any time or space travel so we're saying light is timelessly connecting events a and b uh, but for the inertial observer they will measure a light like separation events a and b are not separate according to light but the point b is advanced in time by 20 minutes due to the simultaneity principle or the asynchronicity principle so I, I like to use an example of time zones as a metaphor. Um, on Earth, we have time zones. Uh, it's, it's a similar concept. I mean, obviously totally different, but it's a metaphor. If uh, event A happens in a time zone at 5 o'clock and it's instantaneously received at point B, uh, even if it's instantaneously received with no time separation between it for the light, when light arrives or when light, what light is connecting at point B is 20 minutes uh, ahead of where it left because there's an actual change in the geometry of space-time, not because time has actually passed. So step three, quantum indeterminism requires B as a superposition of possibilities, not as a definite state. If you think about it, if light experiences no time, it still must connect two different events A and B for an inertial observer. It's not experiencing any time difference between them, but they are different events because the inertial observer measures them as different. And if A and B were both fixed events, this would not be possible because when the light left event A, it would uh, immediately arrive at a previously fixed event B. But we know that uh, quantum indeterminism says that the, the process one uh, collapse of the wave function collapses into an, an indeterminate state. And so we can't say that state B would be predetermined. So how do we make state B un not predetermined? Well. Indeterminism requires B as a superposition of possibilities rather than a definite state. So on the left here we have the, the old diagram of the time zones and that can't be true because B can't be predetermined. Uh, since light is traveling instantaneously between A and B, B must be a superposition of possibilities, possible outcomes. And on the right I've got a diagram that tries to show that, although I didn't want to stay up way too late before the night before the conference uh, making this look the best it could. You can see the timeline splits from one history into two histories from A to B. So there's two possible outcomes and therefore the the result that is measured by the inertial observer is going to be one of those two outcomes which is not determined beforehand but um, is also able, the light is able to connect points A and B timelessly without making it predetermined. And last step four, retroactive event determination. So what this is essentially saying is that the entire history from A to B must become retroactively determined when B is observed. All the events leading up to event B were in a superposition between A and B. And when we measure one of those states and get a result, a definite result, we know that all of the things that happened in between must also fall into place retroactively. And that's what I call retroactive event determination. So here we have a couple of diagrams, and don't read the text, it's actually not for the right example, but I, I did want to use this for the diagrams. Um, we have an object on the left, object S, starts in the state at the, at the bottom, starts in a single state, splits into two states, S1 and S2, two different histories, and an observer Q observes uh, S and, and actually also splits into two different histories because this is drawn from the perspective of P. So now S and Q are both in uh, a superposition of states from P's point of view. S being the light and Q being an observer. Uh, P is a second observer and hasn't made a measurement until on the right you can see he does make a measurement and S and Q both fall into a single history, what I'm calling history two. And history one ceases to exist at that point. It was just a superposition of possibilities, and when one of them becomes actualized, the others drop away. So conclusion two, uh, light doesn't objectively travel. It just appears to have traveled. Light is in an indeterminate state between observations, and it's in an observer-dependent observer state. In other words, observation in the information theoretic sense of gaining information about. So observers include all objects, whether they're conscious or not. 
Uh, I, I say more about that in the paper, but this is not having to do with some anthropomorphic view of human beings or any conscious being uh, or live being making a measurement. Um, retroactive event determination is actually part of uh, the consistent histories formalism, although it's not recognized there, but uh, this, this set of equations is straight out of consistent histories by Griffiths. Um, we have ZA and ZB are two parallel histories that we saw in the previous example diagram. Um, you have uh, going from time 0 to time 1 to time 3 to time 5, and the states S and Q become correlated. S1 goes into, S goes into state S1, and Q1 goes into state Q1 um, in the first history, and similarly for the second history, they both go into state 2. But when P makes an observation, one of the equations, one of the families of histories uh, sticks around, and the others get wiped out because they're not uh, actualized. Uh, and everything else if the observation is made at T5, everything at T1, 2, 3, and 4 is going to be retroactively determined um, as that history becomes the one that's actualized. Um, so I, I'm going to jump ahead and uh, look at macro objects because so far we've just talked about light. Um, but this is I'm also going to say that this is true for macroscopic objects and in fact for all objects. And again, go to the paper for more information. But most arguments against MQS states, macroscopic quantum superposition states, are uh, such like decoherence is, is the main one. Um, and they're motivated by the quote-unquote evidence that MQA states obviously don't exist. We say they obviously don't exist because every time we make a measurement of the world, we get a single definite state for the things we're, we're interacting with. So it seems obvious to people that MQA states just don't exist. So then we try and explain why. But I will go ahead and argue that uh, microscopic quantum superpositions are also not directly observed. We never observe a superposition state. The very point of measurement is to choose one state over the others. What we say is that when we're not making an observation, the mathematics of the system is described as the superposition of states. And so that same reasoning would apply equally well to macroscopic states when we're not making an observation we describe the world as a superposition. But every time we make a measurement, we get a definite result. That's exactly what happens in, in the microscopic world as well. So there's no real reason logically why we should just, by common sense, rule out macroscopic quantum superposition states, or unless we're also going to rule out the micro ones. And decoherence as an argument is generally based on the assumption of objective definite states, i.e. the environment, um, which is thrown out in the relational model. So we have... Uh, uh, microscopic quantum superpositions being wiped out by interacting with a definite environment, an objective environment, and that's thrown out in this model. There is no objective environment. Everything is relationally defined, and so the quantum superpositions uh, actually extend on out to all levels. You can see my paper in the Journal for Scientific Exploration in 2011. Here's an example of a diagram uh, as a, of a macroscopic situation. You're at a, uh, you are person P, you're at a party, and um, let's say that there happens to be some other person S that you uh, either know really well and, and would be really excited to see, or maybe that is somebody who is going to help you out with your paper that you're working on because you've got these ideas and they're going to come along and give you some new ideas. Uh, you don't know that they're there, but there's this possible synchronicity that you would run into somebody and it would seem faded. Um, it would seem like it was a meaningful coincidence for you. Well, and the question I want to ask is if you go to door one, let's say you run into them and it's an accident, right? That's a random connection. But what happens if you decided to go to door two? Would you have then missed this experience altogether? Is it completely random or is there some way in which either history could end up allowing you to meet this person no matter what you choose? I'm going to claim that that's the case. So the model here from retroactive event determination is that person S splits into two different possible histories, the bottom one and the top one. Um, heading to door one and to door two, from your point of view, if you're P. And even if some other person Q comes along to observe them, they don't collapse them. They actually enter into a quantum superposition with S from your point of view. So according to P now, Q and S are both in a superposition of door one and door two until P goes to make a measurement and walks out one of the doors, in which case he might be able to run into that person because both histories are possible at either door. So again, this is the same uh, diagram of RED, uh, the families of, of histories. And at the, at the bottom there, at, when P observes, 
history uh, two is selected and all of the steps leading up to that for person S and person Q fall into place. And they would agree on the fact that they were both in history two at all times. So how to characterize this model of RED? You have to forget the idea of real and unreal. You can't ask those questions. You have to forget the idea of past, present, and future. And you have to focus on the idea of determined versus undetermined from your point of view. So we're going to look at what's determined from your point of view and what's undetermined from your point of view. Some events are, are determined. I have info about them. Some events are undetermined. I don't have info about them. All future events are undetermined because I don't have any information about them, but they are constrained by the consistency conditions from my past and my present. And events in the past that I don't have information about would not be determined yet. They would be undetermined. And that's the important part about RED, retroactive event determination. And this is what's so important. I mean, this is the main implication of this theory is that events in the past are not yet determined if you haven't observed them. So I like to point out synchronicity could be connected to this. I have not described how meaningful history selection or synchronicity might work, but RED is the perfect structure to allow for this kind of meaningful history selection. And if it was the case that, that it did work that way, uh, synchronicity would probably be ubiquitous in our lives, um, happening all the time, even if we don't really know how to recognize it. I think that's the prediction of this theory, though. Just briefly, uh, I want to point out that this theory uh, could be claimed to be solipsistic, and I go to great lengths to show that that's not the case in the paper. Um, to restate the goals, we're almost done. Light doesn't objectively travel. It just appears to have traveled when measured. The state of light and everything else is observation dependent. Step one, uh, time is equal, delta t equals zero for light. Step two, light must timelessly connect state A with state B. Step three, quantum indeterminism requires that B is a superposition of possibilities. Step four, retroactive event determination. And thanks for not interrupting and lots of time for questions. You can hit me up at www.skynelson.com or www.expectingsynchronicity.com for uh, any kinds of questions or to read more. There are papers at all different levels if you're interested in layman's or uh, technical papers. They're both there. Here are some of the references uh, that I've, uh, I've touched on and uh, you can find some great information in those papers. Thanks for watching.